Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Paul Kengor of Grove City College. I've been teaching here since 1997, political science and a number of other courses, including Marxism, which is a course where I talk about a lot of these things that you're going to hear today. And I'm also the senior academic fellow of the Institute for Faith and Freedom, which prior to that was the Center for Vision and Values. Faithandfreedom.com is our website. So good to be with you all, and I'm glad the college is doing this series, and I'm glad they asked me to do this presentation on communism, socialism, and democratic socialism. What's the difference? It's a question that, <laughs> that a lot of people ask all the time and are wondering about more and more today, especially as these ideas, strangely, become more popular in America, unlike any time maybe ever before, and certainly in the last maybe 70, 80 years, going back to the 1930s, maybe. So the Communist Manifesto, published by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in 1848, it was the official programmatic statement of what was then the Communist League, which was a group of about 40 to 50 people. And Marx and Engels were tasked by the League. It's a group of almost entirely men, German men, you know, white European males, <laughs> one female that was, that was Marx's wife. And they were, they tasked Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels with writing a manifesto, a programmatic statement of what we really believe. In fact, Engels said to Marx, he said, give a little bit more attention to, to our title for our, for our piece. I think we should, um, we should drop the idea of a communist confession of faith and just call it the manifesto. So they, they use this sort of religious-like language all the time, which is perfect because for many communists, communism ended up becoming uh, almost like a faith. Raymond Aron called it the opium of the intellectuals. Uh, Ronald Reagan said Marxism-Leninism, that religion of theirs. And the people in the party, especially the people who left the party, Arthur Kessler, Darkness at Noon, the book The God That Failed, all the time they would say that Marxism, Leninism, communism was like a faith to the people who followed it, which is ironic because they were all atheists, or they're supposed to be atheists. So they wrote in 1846, 1848, the Communist Manifesto. The opening words of the Communist Manifesto, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. So they actually looked at, they described communism as this specter. In fact, the next line, they said, all of the ancient powers of Europe, from Metternich to the Tsar to the Pope, in fact, the Pope, who was Pope Pius IX, two years earlier in 1846, published Qui Pluribus, denouncing communism. And, and they said, Marx and Engels said, all of these ancient powers are allied in this attempt to exorcise this specter. They described it as kind of like a demonic specter that needed to be exercised, purged. That's how people saw it. That's people from the very beginning saw communism as a very, very dangerous ideology. So we could spend a lot of time just on the manifesto. I give the entire talk just on the manifesto. But people will ask me often, okay, if you had to define communism in a single sentence, how would you do it? So, well, that's easy. Marx and Engels did it in a single sentence. And as it says in the slide, they said the entire communist theory or program may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. Four words, abolition of private property. And they double down on that in case anyone thinks, well, they didn't really think about eliminating private property. I mean, you can't do that. I, that's going to that's gonna cause... It, it, it's going to cause bloodshed. I mean, my daughter can tell you, my, my 10-year-old daughter can tell you, if you try to take away people's private property, you're going to need guns. You're going to need gulags. You're going you're gonna to have a war on your hand. You're going to have to kill a lot of people. I mean, the, the idea of private property, a basic right, a fundamental right, some consider it a natural right. Back to the cave, the courthouse, Judeo-Christian law, the idea of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal assumes that people have the right to property, which isn't to say that you can't share that property, especially willingly, but they wanted to actually abolish private property. So they double down on it. In the manifesto, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property? Precisely so. That is just what we intend. That is exactly what we intend to do. They, they understood, Marx and Engels, just how radical this was. 
They describe communism as representing, quote, the most radical rupture in traditional relations. Marx acknowledged that his views on property stood contrary to the social and political order of things. So for people wondering, didn't they realize how radical this idea was to abolish private property? Yeah, they got it. They knew it. They knew how radical it was. I mean, this isn't just like tinkering with tax rates or sharing a little bit of wealth. I was talking about this later. One of the attractions of socialism and even Marxism to a lot of younger people is they describe it as, as sharing, right? People being kind to one another, uh, free stuff. But, but these guys said, no, communism represents the most radical rupture in traditional relations. Marx said that communism seeks to do nothing less than abolish the present state of things. Abolish the present state of things. Again, not mere tinkerers. They, they, their most favorite word, Marx and Engels, other than criticism, was abolish. Abolish, abolish, abolish. Start over from the very beginning. The close of the manifesto, everybody remembers the line, workers of the world unite, communists everywhere have a world to win. They also said this, and no one remembers this quote, communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. And remember that because oftentimes I'll get emails from people today who will talk about a particular protest that's going on, a particular rally or riot <laughs> that's going on, on a cause that seems to have nothing to do with economics or redistribution of wealth. And they'll say, hey, Professor Ken Gore, why is this guy there waving this hammer and sickle flag? What are the communists doing there, right? I mean, this is a rally for you know, same-sex marriage. Why, why are the communists? Well, Marx didn't write about that stuff. If it's a movement that's against the existing political order of things, a revolutionary movement that's about abolishing the present state of things, they'll be there because the idea of Marx and Engels was to burn down the house and start over from, from the very beginning. They also said that communists openly declare that their ends can be, that their ends can be attained. All right, look at this very carefully. Their ends can be attained. These are the communists, Marx and Engels speaking for themselves only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. A forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. They're talking about changing just a few things. They're gonna overthrow by force all existing social conditions, which is why people in the day who actually read this stuff Unlike a lot of people today who haven't read the stuff but still think that they probably believe it, the people who read the stuff said, this is the craziest thing we've ever heard. This is beyond revolutionary. This is really, really, really radical. To which Marx and Engels would have said, yes, it is. Marx, in a letter to his friend Arnold Rouge, called for the ruthless criticism of all that exists. The ruthless criticism of all that exists. All, everything, abolish, criticize, my next slide, there is a 10-point plan in the Communist Manifesto. People will often say, well, yeah, Manifesto is a pretty good book if you just read it. It talks in real general terms about sharing the wealth. You know, right away, anyone who said that has not actually read it. And I, I often hear, too, they don't give very many specifics in the Manifesto. They just talk broadly about ideas. There's a 10-point plan in the Communist Manifesto. They give all, ki all kinds of specifics. Here are just a few, and I could do all 25 minutes just on this. I'm not, I'm not going to because I, I would run out all of my time, but again, you could freeze this and look at it, study it. Abolition of property and land and application of all rents, land to public purposes. Look at point two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax which is what America got permanently in 1913. We had to amend the Constitution, the 16th Amendment, in order to get a permanent graduated progressive income tax. My favorite, number three, abolition of all right of inheritance. Abolition of all right of inheritance. You know, say, share this with the millennial at Starbucks drinking a grande skim latte with a little Karl Marx bumper sticker on her laptop. Ask her how would she like it if she couldn't inherit any of her parents' money when they died. If all of that, all of it, all right of it, just went to the federal collective, 
to redistribute, abolish all right of inheritance. What's especially hypocritical about this is that Marx and Engels lived entirely off of their parents' inheritance. And when Marx was cut off by his mom and dad, he sponged totally for the rest of his life off of Engels. Engels was his sugar daddy. Engels subsidized Marx for the rest of his life off of his father's inheritance. There's tremendous hypocrisies all through Marx and, and the life of Marx. Five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with an exclusive monopoly. Look at point six, centralization of all communication and transport in the hands of the state. All communication and transport. By the way, communication in 1848 was what? I mean, it wasn't much. Today, it would be phones, internet, texting, uh, you know, all, all means of communication, which is why, too, uh, it drives me crazy when people are Marxists today. This is a book written for 1848. Uh, there's no way that you could do this. This is written for a certain time in the Industrial Revolution. This cannot possibly fit in any way our day. It's just impossible. It, it's, it's completely anachronistic. No way. Doesn't fit. My favorite. Point nine, gradual abolition. Think about this. Stop and think about this. Gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country. Hmm. <laughs> How are you going to do that? By a more equitable distribution of the population over the country. So they didn't want to just redistribute your stuff. They wanted to redistribute you. They wanted to more equitably distribute the population, people, human beings across the town and country. So when you see the beginning of movies like The Killing Fields, where everybody's coming out of the capital of Phnom Penh, Cambodia, being emptied out into the countryside, right? They are, they are redistributing people out into the countryside. Mal did it right? Collectivists do this. They don't want to just redistribute your stuff, but you, but you. I would think a liberal would think that's really bad, <laughs> right? Point 10, didn't know this was in there, right? Free education for all children in public schools. They wanted to ban private education, religious education, and put all people in government schools. The Bolsheviks and others did that immediately. As Marx and Engels say in the preface to these 10 points, of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads. In other words, <laughs> you're gonna need tyranny, despotism to be able to do this. There are people reading the 10 points thinking, dude, there's no way you can do this without using despotism. Marx and Engels would have said, correct. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So this idea of the manifesto is just about being kind and sharing things. Nonsense, absolute ignorance. Marx hated religion. Uh, I did a book called The Devil and Karl Marx where I go through all of Marx's thinking on religion. The famous line of the opiate of the masses, opium of the masses, that's often people will say, well, Marx is just talking there about how people kind of lean on religion as a sort of crutch. And I can understand that, you know? And that's true, people do that. Read the whole essay. All right, here's just one section of it. The money quote with the opium of the people. Marx said, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Marx didn't like religion. He was also very anti-Semitic, uh, strict evolutionist, and, and also too, and I could give an entirely separate presentation on this, a racist. In fact, go to our website for the Institute for Faith and Freedom and look at the piece that I did on Marx on Christianity, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and, and, um, and religion. Did I say that right? And race, and race. You'll be able to find it. It was my name on our website. Marx said communism begins where atheism begins. Lenin, who was Marx's leading disciple, it's often called Marxism-Leninism, we'll get to him in a minute, said, all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. There is nothing more abominable than religion. 
Lenin said religion is a kind of medieval mildew, a sort of spiritual booze. Booze. In addition to wanting to abolish religion, my next slide here, they wanted to abolish the family. Did you know that this is in the manifesto? Abolition of the family, exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. It was already infamous in 1848. In fact, Pope Pius IX warned about it in 1846. The communists were already known for their attacks on the family. All right, add that to the list of different things to abolish. Marx wrote to Engels, who had no children. Marx had several children. Blessed is he who has no family. Two of Marx's daughters committed suicide in suicide pacts with their husbands. It's the only figure I know of in history who had two daughters who committed suicide in suicide pacts. With, with their husbands. Marx and Engels in the Manifesto. Oh, right. Manifesto is a pretty good book. Talks about sharing the wealth, right? It, also, it says this. Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? By the way, you think they would say here, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. No, they say, to this crime, we plead guilty. <laughs> but you will say we destroy the most hallowed of relations when we replace home education by social. They, they, they blasted what they call the disgusting bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, the hallowed correlation of parent and child. I've got news for you folks. Um, the relationship between parent and child is hallowed. And these guys have no right to stop it. So these ideas are put in place. Who are these three? We got Stalin, Lenin, and Trotsky. October 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution. They eventually seize control in a coup that leads to a Russian civil war, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Seven million men, women, and children died in that civil war. That was after Russia lost more people in World War I than any other country. Russia would never be the same. But it's not just Russia. Communism sought to be global. Marx said in the end of the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, the communists have a world to win, a world to win. Workers of the world unite. This had to be a worldwide revolution, which is what so bothered so many American pr uh, presidents, including progressives like Woodrow Wilson, who, um, though, the, though he was the progressive's progressive, was intensely anti-communist. He read their stuff, and he would tell his fellow progressives, you don't go here. <laughs> this, these guys are really bad. Wilson was a, was a, was a devout five-point Calvinist. He also saw how bad these guys were toward, toward religion. Marx in 1850 at the Communist League speech, our task is to make the revolution permanent in all the leading countries in the world. Lenin, our victory will be a lasting victory only when our undertaking will conquer the whole world because we launched it exclusively counting on world revolution. And look at this. This is when Lenin in March 1919 launched the Soviet Comintern, the Communist International. More on that in a second on my next slide. He said, the existence of the Soviet Republic side by side with the imperialist states is unthinkable. In the end, either one or the other will conquer. And before this result, a series of horrible conflicts between the Soviet Republic and the bourgeois states is unavoidable. This was going to be, next slide, a world revolution orchestrated by the Comintern, the Communist International out of Moscow, which was going to direct all the different communist parties in the world. America, several months later, in September 1919, formed in Chicago the American Communist Party. There's some quotes on that in this slide. I'm going to flip to the next slide as well. Here are some quotes from members of Communist Party USA in the United States, what they committed themselves to. Freeze the screen and read through those quotes. As Langston Hughes said, put one more S in the USA to make it the USSA when we take over. And before we exit communism, that's the Black Book of Communism published by Harvard University Press, the seminal book on the subject. 
estimated the communist regimes in the 20th century killed about 100 million people. Here's an added slide on some additional numbers on how many people the communists killed. It's easily over 100 million. It's probably closer to 140 million. And as you can see there, I give uh, actual numbers. And at the end of the slide, I'll put up four of my books, which uh, you could go to as added references for some of the documentation on this. All right, here's what's so troubling today. We have in America many modern millennials who support communism and socialism. This young man, a West Point cadet, is wearing a picture of Che Guevara under his cadet uniform. Che, who called America the great enemy of mankind. And communism is, uh, here's another slide with some data. You can see here with these polling numbers, a 2014 Reason Roop survey found that 53% of 18 to 29 year olds view socialism favorably. And Gallup found that 69% of millennials said they'd be willing to vote for a socialist for president. And millions did so in the person of Bernie Sanders. I'll give some data on that in a minute. Okay, so what's socialism? How is that different? The universally accepted definition of socialism is this, common ownership of the means of production. Now, if you ask 10 different socialists today for a definition of socialism, you're probably gonna get 10 different answers, all right? But here's what it really means and is what, it, what it's supposed to mean. In fact, if you Google it, one of the first thing that pops up is a Merriam-Webster definition. Socialism, states Merriam-Webster, is government ownership of the means of production. According to Marxist theory, socialism is the final transitionary step toward communism. So communism would progress through various stages from feudalism to capitalism to socialism to communism. And during that process, all of these institutions, property, democracy, family, religion, the state, even money would wither away. But socialism would be the final transitionary step to communism. It was the union of Soviet socialist republics. Before the Bolsheviks were the Bolsheviks, they were the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Vladimir Lenin on the distinction between socialism and communism. Said Lenin, this brings us to the question of the scientific distinction between socialism and communism. Well, what is it? He said, what is usually called socialism was termed by Marx the first or lower phase of a communist society. And so far as the means of production becomes common property, the word communism is also applicable here, providing that we do not forget that this is not complete communism. So socialism, again, leads into communism. Lenin said in his 1920 speech to the Russian Young Communist League, why do we call ourselves communists? What is communist? Communism is a Latin word, right? Which means that the people, it, com, the land, the factories are owned and the people work in common. That is communism. Communism is common ownership of the means of production, which is what socialism is too. So socialism, is just the final transitionary step to getting to full communism. Communists also supported democracy. Look carefully at this. Lenin, who supported democracy, really? Democracy means equality. Democracy is of enormous importance to the working class in a struggle against the capitalists, but democracy is only one of the stages on the road from feudalism to capitalism and from capitalism to communism. Communist Party USA called it economic democracy. So for them, democracy meant equality, equality. Engels spoke on the value of democracy. Same kind of thing. I'll let you pause and read that. Here are two famous right-wingers, <laughs> Mussolini and Hitler, were both socialists. These were big government guys. And Mussolini was not only a socialist, but a Marxist. Another slide. Here's a definition of socialism by today's World Socialist Party. Note what it says in bold. We call this common ownership, but other terms we regard as synonymous are communism and socialism. They consider communism and socialism 
synonymous. Today, there's something called 21st century socialism. 21st century socialism, this is the Wikipedia definition. There's Hugo Chavez next to his successor, Maduro, in Venezuela. Socialism of the 20th century has democratic socialist elements, they concede, but primarily resembles Marxist revisionism. All right, here we are in America today. 21st century socialism, Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. They are the leading advocates. Bernie is a lifetime socialist. He was an independent before he became a Democrat to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. In 1980 and 84, he was a formal presidential elector to the Trotskyist Socialist Workers' Party. So Democrats or Republicans were deciding to vote for Carter or Reagan, <laughs> Reagan or Mondale. Bernie was with the Trotskyist Socialist Workers' Party. There he is in the bottom in his um, honeymoon of the Soviet Union in 1988. Look at the quote in bold. Democracy, says Bernie, means public ownership of the means of production. Now we just learned, no, 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 no. That's the definition of socialism, isn't it? Yes. And he's defining democracy in the same way he's defining socialism as public ownership of the means of production. That guy came in second in 2016 and 2020 in the Democratic Party primary. Here's Bernie today. He told NPR when he talks about uh, democratic socialism, he means, I want a vibrant democracy. The leading democratic socialist group in America today is the Democratic Socialists of America. That's their website. You can check it out. And as you can see here, they call themselves the leading largest socialist organization in the United States. These are the leading members of the DSA who are now elected to Congress. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar. Today, the Democratic Socialists of America, which was begun in 1982 by Michael Harrington and was down to like 5,000 members by the end of the Cold War, is now at almost 95,000 members, or what they call comrades. That number is double from 2016, 2017, when they were at 40,000 members. They have doubled in just the last five years, and they have chapters on hundreds of campuses. Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez says that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez represents the future of our party. Cenk Igar and the Justice Democrats worked with the DSA. They've had a split in recent years. That's a more complicated issue. I've written on it in articles for the American Spectator. But their goal is to primary vulnerable mainstream Democrats in the Democratic primary with Democratic Socialists of America candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That's how they're winning these seats. And in the 2022 election, they won a bunch of them again. In fact, here in my area in Pittsburgh, Summer Lee, who had been a member of the DSA, got elected by, again, running in a safe Democratic district against a mainstream Democrat. That's how they're winning. They're not running against Republicans in conservative districts. They're running against Democrats in traditional districts. All right, wrapping up, how to respond to this. Know this kind of information. No more than the other side does. If you ask 10 out of 10 socialists for a definition of socialism, you're gonna get 10 different answers. Ditto for 10 Democratic Socialists. And to be fair, if you ask 10 out of 10 conservatives for a de definition of conservatism, you're probably gonna get 10 different definitions there too. But understand what their, all, their ideology really is. Educate, educate, educate. And as these two kids who are wearing these shirts, that's not a Che Guevara t-shirt like you think it is. It says communism killed 100 million people and all I got was this crappy t-shirt. So have fun. <laughs> Be a cheerful warrior in arguing against these ideas. And one more slide here, a little shameless capitalist plug. These are some of my books on the subject. So if you're wondering where I've gotten a lot of this information, where you can get it documented, I footnote it in these different books. Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, Devil and Karl Marx, The Communist, The Pope and a President. These are just uh, some of the books that, that I've written. 
So the time has flown by here. It's been 30 minutes. I have to wrap up. Sorry if I went through these slides quickly, but I know in this presentation that you can freeze them, you can pause them, you can think about it. And if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to email me at my college address, kengorepg at gcc.edu. And I thank you very much for tuning in and listening. Thanks. God bless. Thank you.